Hey, good morning, everyone. This is Stacy Plaskett, and once again, we're in Coffee with Stacy, and it's a Saturday morning. <clears throat> this morning, I'm dragging a little bit, so I'm really going to need your help. I traveled last night, and uh, that always has me uh, worn the heck out. Um, I don't, you know, usually, sometimes I um, I can handle that. Um, Sometimes it, uh, it it was a difficult one. I think particularly in this age of COVID, as people are calling it, it makes it difficult to travel. I'm really, really very, very conscious about um, not trying to inf be infected and, you know, the mask, making sure the mask is there and uh, wiping down. You know, I have a whole routine of wiping down chairs, seatbelt inside the seatbelt, all of that. Um, and then when I get home, and then Jonathan has his own process for me out on the porch with my disinfecting before I can come in the house. So, um, you know, it, it's, it gets me tired a little bit. And the day before travel, uh, I'm usually trying to make sure that uh, as my staff and family have me as the pack mule, that I am also bringing what they need back and forth. Um, so let's give you an example. Um, Shapira, just so you're aware, I brought guava tarts, pineapple tarts, coconut tarts, some even some coconut, some drops um, for Talia. Um, what, what are you guys? Are you team guava, team pineapple, team coconut? I know people fight about that. I'm, I'm team guava. I love guava tarts more than anything else. But today we're gonna have a really, really, I think very interesting conversation um, because we're going to be talking to some real practitioners, experts in an area that has been on the news, um, that's been in conversation, that's even a part of the presidential conversation um, due to the fact that uh, Vice President Biden has picked Kamala Harris, who was a district attorney and was a um, prosecutor, right, and was the attorney general, this notion of imprisonment and mass incarceration. And what does that mean? So I have some amazing guests, um, some friends who are going to be in on the conversation with me. And that always makes it great. I'm just so, I always feel blessed that I have a circle that's wide enough that some of the topics that you all are interested in, the topics that I'm interested in, um, I know I'm like, oh, I know somebody who has some real expertise in that. So um, Shapiro, are you gonna bring them on to the show so we can hear from them? Um, so we got some good folk here. This is gonna be really interesting. Um, uh, woo, why is that weird? Okay, so um, I'm going to let everybody know who we got here. We'll start with, um, I believe is the youngest, is Kristen Clark, we'll go by age. <laughs> <laughs> so the baby gets to go first. <laughs> Kristen Clark um, is with the Lawyers Committee um, and we'll let her give you the full title and what she does there. She is uh, one of my Phenomenal, I, you know, um, Leroy, my father always told me, you know, I wanted to, to try out for cheerleading and my father was like, cheerleading? Yeah. People, people cheer us, we don't cheer people. Uh, <laughs> you, you, can't, you can't do that. <laughs> you, you need to be on the team. But listen, Kristen, I am your cheerleader. Anytime, any way, I am so just in love with everything you do and your um, the way you do it. So why don't you tell us about your organization and what you all are committed to? Thank you so much, Congresswoman. It's great to be here. An honor to join all of you today for this important discussion. And um, thank you for your leadership during these really turbulent times. It's been impressive seeing Congress just forging ahead with the work in the midst of the pandemic. And so grateful for you. 
Uh, so I'm president and executive director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. We're a national civil rights organization on the front lines fighting issues that range from uh, criminal justice, education, fair housing, hate crimes, um, and doing a lot of work right now to battle voter suppression and to make sure that everyone can exercise the right to vote in our country. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and you guys were founded uh, during the time of, uh, under the Kennedy administration, right? Yeah, we were founded in 1963 by uh, JFK. He put out a call to action in the Hayden Civil Rights Movement, just several days after Medgar Evers, a voting rights activist in Mississippi was killed. And just uh, during a time of great turmoil in the country. He, he called a meeting and lawyers from across the country came and met with him at the White House. And he said, look, you all need to roll up your sleeves and start to figure out how you can use your law practices in your community to step up and engage in the civil rights fight. And so um, that call to action gave birth to our organization. And what makes us unique is that we carry out all of our racial justice work in partnership with lawyers at law firms across the country who provide pro bono support for the work that we do. Awesome, great. So, um, <clears throat> and then next is Jason Foy. Um, Jason has a very unique perspective, but he's a, because he's an attorney, but he started out uh, practicing law as a prosecutor in New York. We worked together in the Bronx DA's office and now he has his own practice, he's in private practice, where he does a range of um, legal work, but also is a criminal defense attorney. So he can give us the perspective um, from both tables um, behind the bar. I think that's really interesting. Jason, can you tell us about some of the work that you've been doing now and where do you find much of your criminal defense work? Um, where is it focused? Stacy, thank you for having me on. Uh, you know, I, I split my time between New York and New Jersey mm -hmm. uh, as far as location, geographical location where I practice. I also practice on the state and federal. So there are two different animals mm -hmm. that try to accomplish the same thing, meaning fair and just outcomes, although there's a big disparity in how that occurs. Mm -hmm. uh, most of my cases right now, I mean, really, there was a slowdown in the beginning of the pandemic because everything kind of just shut down in New York in particular uh, and New Jersey. Uh, but now, you know, we're almost quasi back to normal. Uh, I have a significant load. I think I'm handling about six or seven murder cases right now. Uh, robbery, uh, drugs, of course, is always a part of the mix in the practice. Uh, domestic violence has picked up, so we've gotten a few more of those, and that's always part of the mix, but I've seen it at time after time. It's been an issue. Uh, I think people are stressed, uh, and, uh, you know, that's what I've seen happening now. Great. Um, so then the last individual is really special to me. As you can see, we have the same last name. Um, and uh, Leroy is a retired correction officer um, who worked in New York um, as a correction officer and has been engaged in some really interesting work with um, prison outreach. And, um, you know, I love Leroy not only because he's my family, but um, he's, you know, always been like a big brother to me. Most importantly, because he was born way ahead of me, uh, and they were afraid that my parents were not going to have children. And so he took on the task of being named after my father. So I didn't have to have the name Leroy uh, <laughs> when I was born. So I'm, I'm always very grateful for that. Well, Leroy, do most people call you Leroy? Or do they call you Lee or do they call you Roy? They call me Leroy. Most everyone calls me Leroy. Really? And, you, and you do know my my uh, family nickname. Well, I wasn't going to say it. It's, it's fine with me because it. it's, it's a term of damn it. So I don't, we, I don't in know. the family, his name is Peanut. Yes. So, um, you know, I know some people don't like that, but it, we, no. it was definitely, he was a very small baby, they say, and so that's why they named him Peanut. Yes. Um, 
but you know, I always try and catch myself. I don't call you that in public. I know that's an inside house name. Um, <laughs> it doesn't, I don't mind at all. <laughs> so why don't you tell us about what you, where you have worked and what you are, what you have done in this well, area of prisons. Well, of course you mentioned that I you know, worked in New York City Department of Corrections and I primarily worked at the Brown House Detention where uh, I was the, uh, the uh, what they call uh, religious service slash programs officer. So uh, when we had, when I had inmates come through, I had to you know give them orientation on what the different services they had there at the at the jail to uh, you know help them along with, you know their, with their trial and what have you. And I did not have to, but after I gave them the uh, the ins and out of, of the jail, you know, give them the uh, ins and out of what they can and cannot do in the jail. I would, you know, add my own little spiel about how uh, how the you know, um, not the judicial system, but the uh, jails itself. It's a big business, and them coming in and out of the, out of the jail, it's just, you know, it just helps others that are out there. Uh, you know, how you might say, uh, investing in jails make money, make money on us. And my thing was to let them know that I don't, I don't care whether you're having a bad time or even a good time in the jail. Go home and tell your little brothers and sisters or your sons and daughters and what have you. And uh, let them know that this is not the place to be and what, what, what America has in store for them. And, you know, just to go to school, that education is important to make that important. Do not go off glorify jail when you go back home. So, uh, you know, as of right now, I um I'm retired, and my and what I where I work is at a high school, and all of the teachers they always invite me and other people of law enforcement, uh you know to come in and speak with kids about the perils of going to jail. The school I work in is predominantly Caucasian, but we do have some minorities there, and um I uh I enjoy going into the classroom and speaking to them about the pits and the perils of going to jail. So, you know, um, thank you. I saw one of our um, listeners, Alicia Barnes, who's a senator in the local legislature of the Virgin Islands. Alicia, um, it, this is a really timely discussion. I'm surprised Alicia didn't uh, throw up her colors. She is an AKA, and I know all of the sisters of AKA are reveling right now um, in their fellow soror uh, Kamala Harris's nomination. Um, just know that we are all in the fight together and we are here to make sure that she is sworn in, in Jan on January 21st uh, as the next vice president of the United States. But let's, you know, one of the things that um, I thought, you know, in doing a lot of reading and listening to discussions about this, uh, this issue, you know, everybody talks about the fact that the United States has the highest incarceration rate. Um, but one of the things I think is really important and distinguishing is uh, a term that they call jail churn, um, which is the number of individuals that go into jail, not aren't necessarily um, convicted of a crime, but that are in there waiting in what is called pretrial detention. You know, and um, pretrial detention, um, many individuals do not realize in the last 20 years is the actual, virtually all of the jail growth has been through pretrial detention. Um, and you know, and that has a lot of elements within it itself. Um, Jason, you know, I know that you've seen, you've been there during arraignments, night arraignments, um, as both a prosecutor and then um, as a criminal defense attorney, what are your thoughts about this phenomena of individuals being incarcerated um, and remaining in jail for, you know, sometimes a year or longer, waiting for a trial, waiting to be tried uh, in, in court? You know, that's one of the big problems with the criminal justice system. Um, I understand the principles of pre-trial detention. Usually it's based upon uh, risk of flight, danger to the community. And in New Jersey, they have a third prong uh, likelihood to interfere with the prosecution. And although I suppose uh, there are some legitimate reasons 
to hold someone pending trial. The problem is in New York in particular, it could take two to three years to get to trial. And if you're acquitted, you can't get that time back, that two or three years. You're on mute. Okay. Japira has me muted. Uh, okay. she, she's, she's the puppet master in all of it. Can you explain to people why you could wait two, three years for a trial, particularly in New York, a place like New York? Uh, mostly volume of cases. Mm -hmm. And there's not enough courtrooms, there's not enough judges to handle all the cases at the same time. Um, that's probably the larger reason for it because in New Jersey, uh, where the volume, meaning because the population is less, is less, you're not going to wait two or three years to go to trial as a general rule. I mean, there are exceptions to that, and that's because sometimes unique circumstances happen in a case. For example, when someone has a mental health issue and they're not competent to stand trial, they're still held while they get medical treatment, and once they're competent to stand trial, we're back. So that can create a significant delay. Uh, but in New Jersey, you're generally not going to be, although there are counties that are exceptions to that rule, uh, you're not going to be in for multiple years. Um, so I think a large part of it is the volume of cases. You know, I, I try to explain to people in how in New York City, um, the, the no, night arraignment is there because of volume because the individuals have to be seen after arrest within a certain number of hours um, before a judge. And therefore there are so many arrests that you must in fact have night court or else it, it won't um, be taken. You won't, you won't have that ability. Kristen, can you talk then, uh, I don't know if you're able to, can you talk about over policing in communities, which causes sometimes the number of arrests that happen in a community? Yeah, it's such an important question. I, you know, think about Brianna Taylor and this moment that we're in, and I'm just so glad we're having this conversation. So one thing that I think is incredibly problematic is we just have too many offenses on the book, too many excuses for law enforcement to come into contact with communities. And then you put on top of that racial profiling, and we find that disproportionate uh, you know, amounts of this contact is with black and brown people. Eric Garner, right, allegedly selling a loose cigarette on the streets. Alton Sterling, allegedly selling CDs out of the trunk of his car. George Floyd, less, allegedly passing a small uh, counterfeit $10 bill. You know, you just got to take a step back and think, are these the kinds of offenses where we really needed to deploy armed police officers uh, and, and put law enforcement in contact with, with people over these low level offenses that resulted in loss of life, loss of black life? Um, so I think that this is incredibly problematic and just thinking about the matrix of things deemed crimes in our country you know, we have got yeah. to do work on this and we've got to figure out how we reduce um, the amount of times that armed police officers are coming into contact with black and brown folks. Um, there's this whole movement right now to defund the police. And I actually um, don't uh, embrace, uh, you know, shutting down law enforcement. We need law enforcement to keep our community safe, but we do need a smaller footprint for law enforcement in our communities. And I think part of that can come about by getting rid of the um, unnecessary small level, low level, uh, nonviolent offenses that are on the books. And also thinking about how we can shift resources into funding um, services for our communities, dealing with poverty, dealing with mental illness, dealing with substance abuse. So I was going to ask um, Roy, Jason, if you guys want to step in and you know have a conversation about that, that over policing and police engagement in the community. Um, you know, you both are black men uh, as well as having your professions. Um, you were you in particular. I mean, how many people have you seen in jail 
are people that you grew up with in the same community or their children or their grandchildren um, that you, you know, the police engagement in our community. Yes, I'm enjoying all of this uh, this conversation that everybody's bringing to the table. And I agree with everything that Jason is saying and as Clark is saying. And um, as far as the jails in the Bronx, I grew up in the Bronx. And I know many of people that came through there that were my age and older than me that I knew. I knew many people coming in and out of their jail. But what I see as me personally, what I see is one of the problems in our communities is that we have police policing our communities and they don't have they don't have any uh, emotional attachment to the community. They don't understand the community. And this is what happens when they get engaged with us. They don't know how to engage with us and they go overboard. They use force, they use excessive force where they would either hurt, where they would hurt the person they're trying to arrest or anyone in the general area. Now, I, I've never gotten myself in trouble ever growing up in the Bronx. I grew up in one of the, one of the most notorious, I won't say notorious, but one of the roughest neighborhoods in the Bronx. And there's many good people there, many good people there. But anytime something happens there that is bad, of course, the news will blow it out of proportion. Not necessarily blow out of proportion, but they, they put that out there as something for people to see. So that's what people, that's why people think that black communities or minority communities are, are bad communities, but you have a lot of good people there. I myself traveling to work and even going to visit my mom have been a victim of quote unquote police brutality. I handle the situation, but that's the, that's the, the case in our communities. I feel that we have uh, people that don't understand our community coming in there and policing us and all the bad things happen because of that. Especially, especially like uh, Ms. Clark mentioned, uh, Eric Gardner and the mm -hmm. chokehold. Mm -hmm. in, in, the, in, the police, in, a, in the police academy, correction academy and police academy, we get the same training and they don't train us to uh, grab people in a chokehold because of course, as you see, it can, what can happen, uh, they train us to grab people what they call an arm and headlock. You won't be able to choke a person, you put them in an arm and headlock, you can control their body completely. If you have somebody upper body in control, you can move them anywhere you want. If I have someone's upper body mo movement going left or right, their feet have to follow. So an arm and headlock, very easy to do. And then on, when you have someone in an arm and headlock, their hands are already in the air. I mean, I can't demonstrate it on you guys, you know, because we're on a video chat, but arm and headlock works perfectly fine. And I just, again, find that uh, you have police out there that just doesn't have any, uh, any, you know, how you might say, uh, they don't have any uh, sympathy excuse me, sympathy for the, uh, for the community they work in. I right. think we just need more of us in that community. Jason, what are your thoughts? You know, I think it's more difficult in big cities to get that uh, <clears throat> feel, right? Because in New York City, a lot of the cops don't live in the city. They live outside the city mm -hmm. and they come into the city and police the city. Now, you know, I don't know that we want to mandate that they live in the communities that they just as far as freedom and wanting to live where you want to live. But when you look at New Jersey, which is a bunch of small towns uh, and police don't always live in the town that they police, but I, I see a higher percentage of it happening. Um, there's an opportunity to get to know the community in a different way because they are smaller. Of course, again, there's always exceptions. So Newark, a much larger city, a more dense city. It may become more difficult there. Uh, but, you know, I think the leadership of the police department could uh, potentially affect it by mandating their officers get involved in the community. Don't just police the community, get involved in the Little League and coach or mm -hmm. the rec center. And there's different things you can encourage, uh, the leadership of the police department can encourage their officers and give incentives. Th those who do those kind of work that they get rewarded for getting involved in the community, right? As an attorney, I don't just represent people accused of crimes. I've coached softball. I've you know done different panels, talked at churches, 
uh, because I want to do more than just deal with criminal elements, so to speak. Now, mind you, I'm not suggesting that my clients are criminals, right? Because clearly, clearly there are people who are accused of crimes that are not guilty of what they are, or they're overcharged, or occasionally simply innocent of the crime they were charged with. That's real. That happens. That's not like some uh, aberration. It's something that happens. So uh, let me throw out a statistic. 74% of people held by jails are eventually not convicted of a crime if they go to trial. Wow. That's a tremendous amount of individuals um, sitting in jails right now. Kristen, you're shaking your head. Yeah, well, I'm thinking about Khalif Browder, um, a baby, 17-year-old kid who is locked up, accused of stealing a backpack and held for three years at Rikers Island because he couldn't, his family couldn't post bail. And he spent a lot of time in solitary confinement and is eventually released and is so traumatized from the experience that he committed suicide. Yeah. And um, it's just a heartbreaking story that is emblematic of the tragedy experienced by so many black and brown people who are detained merely because of their poverty. And you know, it you don't see the problem uh, with respect to just those detained uh, because they can't post bail. Uh, we have so many people entangled in our criminal justice system merely because of their poverty. One of the issues that we're battling um, are these debtor prisons that have um, popped up all across the country. These are communities that make money, that literally profit off of locking people up for low-level nonviolent offenses. So we brought a case in um, Sherwood, Arkansas, where they literally set up a court uh, a hot checks court. And this court was just about dealing with one thing, people who write small checks to local merchants like pharmacies, et cetera, and they bounce, small little checks. And um, one of my clients in that case was a woman named Nikki, Nikki Petrie. She had no, no job. She was taking care of a bedridden mother um, who had cancer. And um, she wrote a small $25 check at the local pharmacy that bounced, her finances were in disarray. And over the next five years of her life, she spent 26 days in jail. They locked her up because she couldn't pay off the debt. She had to go to court repeatedly and they would just add fines and fees. So the hole was just growing and mounting. And she paid $600 in fines and fees but at the time we filed the case, she was $2,500 in debt for that $25 check. So to me, this is just a huge problem that shows all of the breaks in our criminal justice system and the ways in which both race and poverty intersect in really yeah. devastating ways for so many vulnerable communities in our country. Yeah. Well, I was, you know, one of the things I was gonna talk about is um, bail and bail reform. Um, you know, it's interesting you brought up Khalif because I know, Leroy, we were talking about the fact that you knew his father. Um, you guys came from the same neighborhood. Um, and how, as, as a correction officer, you know that the documentary and the tapes that they've shown uh, of him in prison, how, how does that make you feel as a correction officer? Well, um, as a correction officer, watching that kind of stuff, even before Cleef Barada. Uh, just to give you an example of how it's easy, not only for Cleef Barada, but for any inmate to be in the situation that he's in. First off, he was, he was his, him and his family were able to uh, post bail for him to get out. So when you're in a jail, you know, anything can happen. You could be minding your own business and someone bothers you, you get into a fight. So the rules in jail is this, if you get into a fight, they call it an infraction. You could have been totally innocent of it, but chances are you're going to be both inmates or be convicted of an infraction where it be, depending on how severe it is, 10 days, 20 days, 30 days, and punitive seg, which Khalid brought it was in. And that's 23 hours locked up in a cell, one hour for recreational shower. And I can tell you the, the cells are small. I believe they are six by nine. It, could, it looks more like six by five in a rectangular shape. It's really a small place for anyone to be locked up in, in, a, in that kind of situation. 
I mean, because of COVID, most people are locked up in their home, so to speak. I mean, we're not locked up, but people see it that way. And look how it's affecting us and we're not in jail. You understand? So imagine how it affected him mentally. So uh, with Khalif Brada and a whole lot of people, I find that uh, they're in jail, of course, longer than they need to, as, as Jason was uh, mentioning, because they can't post bail and they're there for two and three years, just going back and forth to court. And they are not even convicted. They're really still civilians like you and I. They're not property of the state. And if it's a low level crime, let the man go home, let the man or woman go home and they don't have to be subjected to that. Cause again, you can be minding your own business and you can see that he was a small guy. People will probably look to take advantage of him and he's getting days added on him, punitive seg just because he had a fight yesterday, today and so on and so forth. And he's, that's why he stayed in punitive seg for so long, you know? And it's something that was totally, it was seriously unfortunate for him, but that's something that I believe that they're trying to if they didn't already you know stop punitive seg in the jail because it's just so inhumane you, you know, know one of just... the things that uh you know that leroy was talking about is when that happens you get into a fight and you defend yourself and mm -hmm. in america you have a right to defend yourself mm -hmm. when you have that hearing you're not you don't have an attorney to represent your position as to what happened Mm -hmm. And from what I've experienced in talking to clients, because I'm not present for those hearings, their word doesn't carry that much weight in those proceedings. So, you know, you defend yourself legitimately, but hey, you engage in the fight. So you're going to do 30 days, 60 days, get your, you can't see your family, you can't make calls, whatever the penalty is. Um, so, you know, there's a due process issue with what's going on in that respect. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask about, oh, were you going to say something? Yeah, man. And what I found uh, very interesting, I know you guys might have heard of Larry Davis, the uh, uh, guy that shot six officers and, uh, and uh, you know, was exonerated. He was, um, he basically spent his entire time in New York City corrections in punitive sec, not because he did anything wrong. It's because just to protect him from other inmates. And I, myself, and uh, about five other officers were specifically assigned to him at the Bronx house to make sure that no one touched that guy. And he, to his credit, I mean, I'm not saying that he was a great guy in, in society, you know, but to his credit, he did not let that bother him. I think he just actually felt safe. I think mentally he was okay in somewhat of punitive seg because he knew that inmates and officers weren't going to touch him. So I was going to talk about this um, bail issue. And Kristen, I don't know if you've been or your group has been engaged, uh, the level of engagement in bail reform. I know that New York City, New York has uh, had some recent bail reform laws. Um, but one of the things that <clears throat> I was reading and researching is that the median bail for felony is $10,000. Um, $10,000 in for the average individual accounts for eight months of their salary, you know, an eight month salary uh, to be able to make bail. Um, and so people end up staying behind bars uh, waiting for that. So you find that the preponderance of people that are in jail are poor people um, because they're unable to meet that, uh, you know, meet the bail requirements uh, and and end up remaining in jail. Um, Kristen did, or Jason, you guys have any thoughts about bail reform and is it working? What could be still done? How can that help? Yeah, I think this is a, a huge issue. And if we're gonna end mass incarceration, then we have to end cash bail. And uh, we can't tolerate systems that allow people to be de detained simply because of their poverty, simply because of their inability to post that average $10,000 bail um, amount. And you know, this is such an incredibly important issue because you think about the ways in which being detained and you're, you're only accused, right? But when you think about how this disrupts people's lives, right? You have people who pose no threat to society. Many people often detained for non-violent, low-level offenses who can't go to work and take care of their families, who can't continue their education uh, and go to school. And 
what happens on the back end is just complete disruption of, um, of, of family, of community, of people's lives. And people now are bearing arrest records and or criminal records that end up making it more difficult for them to get back on their feet, to find a new job if they lost their job while detained, to uh, find housing if there's somebody who um, uh, you know, may have recently uh, lost their home. Get the right to vote. You know, the criminal conviction can actually, you know, result in loss of the right to vote. So anyway, I think that this is an incredibly um, important part of the work that we've got to do to end mass incarceration in our, in our country. Uh, with, with regards to bail reform in New York, you know, it's a relatively new law. So as anything that's new, there's some growing pains. Uh, is it working? I think the, the issue is, it's the politics around it, right? Mm -hmm. So there are people who are against it or don't appreciate the importance of it. So when things happen in the public, they attempt to use bail reform as the reason. So, right, there's an uptick in shootings. There are people out there advocating for the fact that this has something to do with bail reform. Uh, in New Jersey, they had bail reform in 2017. And, you know, it's been working pretty well. Uh, and I don't see a significant up, there wasn't a significant uptick in shootings in 2017 when it was imposed in 2018. So I don't know that bail reform is the result of uptick in uh, crime, but that's the politics of the issue that kind of get in the way sometimes. Anyway. So, um, mm -hmm. were you yeah. going to say something? Um, yeah, yes. Uh, to you know, piggyback on what uh, uh, what you guys are talking about as far as uh, bail reform, um, I think as as Roy was saying that uh, that uh, it's new, but I think it's something that I hope and should work because um, when you have people. Uh, coming out of jail, I want to get back into society. It's tough for them. Like here in New York, they, they I, have, I have a friend here in Rockland County. He is a activist. His name is Mark Pesson, and his daughter is a an activist, a, a pretty well known activist. Her name is uh, Hallie Pesson. She's a uh, activist for you know social, you know, injustice and what have you. But um, his thing here is to what they call ban the box, ban the a box that you have to uh, check off on your application. Because what normally happens is that when we have black and brown people coming back into society and they truly want to get a job to support themselves and their family, what have you, they can't get a job because they have to check that box. They don't even get a chance to get to the interview process of an employer because they check that box. The employer sees it, throws it away. So what happens to a person like that? After a while, they get frustrated. They will knock me and you over the head just to get something, some food on the table or, to, or whatever, just out of frustration. So I just see it as a vicious cycle in our, in our criminal justice system where black, black and brown people go in and out of jail and it's just, it's a big money maker, a big money maker for society itself. You have big conglomerates investing money in our people going to jail. And it seemed like to me that it's shaped that way for that money to be made. It, it, it is, it's just such, uh, it's, I look at it as, uh, that's a word I like to put on it is, um, you know, new age slavery. That's the way I look at it. It's just, it's just, it's just uh, amazing how, how that works. So, um, you know, it's interesting people talk about the money making in jails. Um, interestingly, only 9% of the jails in the United States are actually privately owned. Um, most of them are, in fact, owned by states, uh, federal government, localities. Um, and that's where you see a tremendous amount of um, activity. But when you talk about slavery, I think what we've seen a growth in all jails is, you know, from the Nixon administration on is uh, a new type of racism um, that's happening. 
And I don't know, Kristen, if you have any thoughts about that. Well, I, you know, I was thinking about the first point that you made about private prisons. Um, I think that this administration has been really devastating when it comes to um, making forward uh, progress on criminal justice issues. And one of the first things that this administration did was it ended a um, an order that would have phased out private prisons at the federal level. And private prisons, even though they're a smaller piece of the pie, tend to be more dangerous, tend to be um, you know, places where um, you know people are suffering abuse, where there's less accountability, and so you know, I do think this is a part of the conversation. Do we want to expand the use of private prisons, given how problematic uh, these institutions are, and how far worse they are, and more egregious the conditions are for people detained in them, vis-a-vis -vis public institutions, but. Um, um, you know, I, one of the things that deeply concerns me is just the, the size of our, our jail and prison populations. 2.3 million people uh, who are detained in some combination of state, uh, federal, uh, juvenile facilities, local jails, community detention centers, military prisons, um, you know, state psychiatric wards. We just have this industrial complex of institutions that detain people at tremendous cost and expense to communities. And when you think about the people who are detained in these facilities, largely being people who don't pose a threat to the community, uh, people who are you know, detained for low level nonviolent offenses, you know, it really, I think, um, needs to prompt a conversation about whether this is the best use of taxpayer dollars. And this moment where we have people who are marching against uh, police violence and, you know, really speaking out against mass incarceration, um, which is the, the kind of close cousin to police violence or the result of police violence, um, you know, it, it's time for us to have a conversation about where we redirect our money, where we redirect our taxpayer dollars. And um, to me, if we're gonna uh, really achieve justice and reform, we've got to figure out how do we make better investments, better investments in schools and communities, better investments to deal with the issues that beleaguer vulnerable people like mental illness and substance abuse. So oh, can you, um, Jason, um, from putting on, taking off your criminal defense hat and looking back, remind, reminding yourself about being a prosecutor, what about uh, alternative sentencing or pleading cases out for, you know, community service or, you know, I, I recall, I don't even know if they have it anymore. I remember there was like the Olin program, right? So if it's a first time offense for a younger individual, getting them involved in some kind of, uh, you know, vocational training or something. What are your thoughts about that and the use of that um, by prosecutors um, to keep people out of prison? Yes, uh, you know, when people think of prosecutors, they think a prosecutor is there to convict and send people to jail and that can be part of the job, obviously. But really a prosecutor's job is to secure justice. And sometimes justice has nothing to do with putting someone in jail. It could be getting them programming and resources, holding them accountable for their conduct, but allowing them to earn a dismissal by participating in the program. So there are uh, district attorney's offices, prosecutor's offices that have programs that are encouraged to be used. The, the issue becomes when it's a more serious crime or you have repeat offenders that keep repeating, uh, then you're getting into a position where a prosecutor feels like they have to be tough on crime. So, you know, we have uh, Senator Harris, she's running for VP, and people are going to try to bring up, Black folks are going to try to bring up, oh, well, she locked up a lot of people and different things. Well, we have to think about what it means to be attorney general of a state where you have to run for election. If you want to win, you can't be talking about being soft on crime, right? You, you cannot do that. Now, right. what I do know is that she did do programs 
as you suggested, that allow for options. So people who have marijuana possession, for example, which is a high volume, low level crime. Right. There were opportunities to do programming to work that off without going to prison. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is an opportunity through uh, prosecution with some empathy, some compassion, some understanding of, you know, the, the, the uh, condition that people are living under that can be put into play. But not right. every jurisdiction feels that way. Right. right. And right. Uh, as a defense attorney, one of my jobs is to understand where I am. Mm -hmm. One mm -hmm. argument may work, let's say, in Newark, Essex County with high volume that won't work in Somerset County in New Jersey, where it's a smaller, uh, you know, where the prosecutor told me in his own words, they're the West Virginia of New Jersey. And I thought, <laughs> wow, you want to say that out loud to me? <laughs> right. And we had that discussion because his position was your man can plead guilty to everything on the indictment. And, you know, we can talk about how much jail. And wow. I was like, no, we're not pleading guilty because we, we could do that a trial then. You right. know, I, we could be found guilty of everything, but I'm not pleading guilty to everything. I, Ultimately, I, we worked it out. Mm -hmm. um, but it depends on the attitudes of the jurisdiction. And, you know, in America, different communities feel different ways about different issues. Sure. And, and in theory, the government's supposed to be a reflection of that. You know, I, I think back on, like, you know, Jason, in the DA's office, those individuals who had higher conviction rates or, you know, were indicting, finding, getting true bills for, in indictments, you know, are rewarded um, in the office as opposed to individuals who are pleading out cases. Or, you know, I remember one time being told that I was overusing, um, you know, programs uh, for young people. Um, and one of the other things that I found I did was um, I, in terms of, you know, arraignment, really tried to not give you, you you'll, you'll see there's a reflection of, oh, this kid comes from a good family. Um, he's never been in trouble before. His parents are there. And so that's the kid you give a break to, as opposed to the kid who comes from nothing has nobody there, um, has been in trouble before, then we're not going to give him or her a break. It's it's kind of, you know, it, the mentality and, and that's forced on everyday line prosecutors is there as well. Uh, and I, re I recall working out plea deals with defense attorneys and making a, a point of trying to say to the defendant in court, please don't say no one ever gave you a chance. I want you to realize that you're getting a chance, that we all are here trying to find uh, an avenue for you to do better. And Jason, I think, you know, it, it incenses me, I guess, as having been a prosecutor, the arguments that are being made against Kamala Harris, because, you know, when they say, oh, she's locked up a lot of black people, one, they never can give you a statistic, right? So per capita to the black community in California, how much more above that was she? Nobody can ever answer that question. It's just that she locked up black people, but they ne never talk about the programs that are there, the restrictions within California law that may or may not have allowed her to do that. You know, judges' hands are tied as well um, in sentencing oftentimes because of the type of um, structure that is put in place by legislators or state laws. Um, Kristen, you know, we often talk about like there's the George Floyd, um, you know, bill right now that has been passed by the House, but there is not a lot of conversation around what is happening at the state level across the country. You know, you can change federal law, and Jason, you work in the federal court system as well. You know, we always talk about the strikes when you're out or some of the other um, impediments there are to uh, keep people from recidivism or keep people from remaining in prison, but we do not talk about um, state laws across the board that might keep people in the position, you know, uh, continue to keep these jails at the size that they are. 
Yeah, you know, that to me opens up a discussion about how do we achieve reform? So, we, you know, we've been talking a lot about all that's broken, but I know for a lot of folks watching, they're probably wondering, okay, what can we do to change the system, to break the system? And um, many thanks to you, Congresswoman, for your leadership along with the CBC and other members of the House. Passage of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act was a really big step because it set out a comprehensive roadmap for how we fix a lot of these issues when it comes to police violence. And I sure hope that Senator Mitch McConnell will get to work and do his job and hold a hearing on that bill. Um, I'll hold your hand on that. <laughs> well, we're gonna still call, we'll, we'll keep calling him we'll out. Keep calling him out. We'll call him we'll keep calling him out. out. But that federal bill is an important one because it can provide a roadmap for states. But it's kind of encouraging to see a lot of the movement that's happening at the state level as um, a number of state legislatures try to figure out, OK, what are the tools in their arsenal that can be used to confront a lot of these problems? And then uh, we got to think about kind of what got us here. Right. And what got us here are the tragic deaths of black people and people are saying enough is enough and marching and protesting. And, you know, I know that for many of the people watching, many of them uh, may have been participating in protests. And I just want to thank them. I want to thank them for their, um, you know, persistence and agitation because I think that that's exactly what we need. We need to make sure that officials feel uncomfortable with this status quo. And, and we need people to keep marching and protesting and demanding change until we get every actor at the federal level, at the state level, at the local level to play their part to help bring about a more fair, a more just, a more equitable, a more non-racist criminal justice system in our country. Uh, Kristen, you were talking about, um, and then I guess we'll have to wrap up. You were talking about uh, defunding the police. You know, I like you am not an, an of the notion that um, you know the police department should be disbanded, but there should be additional funding that's directed towards community services. Individuals should not be calling the police for things that uh, other uh, agencies can can support and being encouraged to do that. But what about differences in police training and um, those, you know, other ways that we can change police departments? Um, Chris and you or Jason, what areas of police training or police structure, police department structures should should be changed to um, alleviate some of this uh, over policing in, in communities, particularly communities of color? Yeah. So. We have a um, an interesting partnership with the International Association of Chiefs of Police, where we work with law enforcement on hate crimes. So many police departments in our country have no idea about how to investigate and uh, handle hate crimes when they happen in their communities. And so together, we have developed a protocol for um, helping police departments do a better job when hate incidents happen. We want to make sure that when hate incidents happen, that people feel like, you know what, I can call 911 and feel like they will be responsive. And um, when it comes to police violence and racial profiling, training is, you know, one, one baby step, but one important step forward. We need strong leadership uh, that can uh, have impact across the ranks. We need accountability. We need officers to know that when you break the law and commit unjust acts, that you actually will be held accountable. And so training is, is an important step forward, but the accountability piece, I think, is a real um, important part of, of how we achieve the culture change that we really need to um, confront fully this crisis of police violence that we're up against. You know, I agree with Ms. Clark. Um, you know, when it comes to, and let me kind of deal with you, the solutions or to mass incarceration, and then I'll get to the police. Uh, you know, there's not one solution because there's many things that go into creating mass incarceration, right? It's the laws. It's how people are policed. It's the politics. It's the mandatory minimum prison sentences. So one of the things of many is can we get rid of mandatory minimum sentences? And 
return the discretion back to the court so each situation can be evaluated for its uniqueness, right? Not every drug sale is the same. There are different dynamics. And you kind of mentioned that as far as the person's background, if they've been in trouble before, uh, you know, who they're selling to in relation to how close to schools, th different things, right? That could be taken into account as to what the appropriate remedy is, the appropriate sanction or, uh, or consequence. So I think that's something that can be done. That requires political will. That requires trust in judges to exercise their discretion because when they do exercise that discretion, the issue is going to be some people are getting a break that other people won't be getting a break. All right. And then we'll have right. to deal with that reality. Right. And when it's, hey, if you get convicted of this, you must do 10 years. Right. Right. You know, Jason, I was just thinking when you said, you know, you know how the laws are, if it's certain feet be in next to a school, um, you don't even take into account sometimes that it the sale took place at 11 o'clock at night. You know, right. it's not in front. It's in, it's physically in front of a school, but there are no children there at 11 o'clock at night. And they sold to an adult, you know, and it's like, but it's school zone. I mean, I hear you. We don't want drugs near school. So I'm not suggesting that should be OK. But that mandatory jail component uh, for nonviolent offense, right? I'm of the opinion that no one should go to jail for selling drugs. I don't care how many times you've done it. You should get a fine. That's my personal opinion, right? Now, I hear you. <laughs> People feel like, no, 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 you break the law. You must go to prison. I know what, not because I've spent any time in prison other than for the 20 minutes when I got arrested one day, but... Other than my 20 minutes in incarceration, I go to visit and I know that that's a dehumanizing environment, that that's mm -hmm. not going to uh, make you better. It's not the thing that's going to stop you if you're inclined to do crimes. That experience oftentimes won't stop you if you have a very difficult circumstance at home. Um, I think jail should be a last resort for violent crimes, for people who are dangerous to the community. But, you know, um, here's something when you talk about violent crimes, right? Um, mm -hmm. And Kristen, I don't know if you're aware of this. So we talk about individuals who create, oh, who um, who commit violent crimes. Um, the likelihood of them committing another violent crime is enormously diminished after that first one because individuals commit violent crimes and greater propensity in early in their um, late adult, um, late adolescence and early adulthood. And that the ability, the, the likelihood of an individual continuing to commit violent crimes, even sex offenses, diminishes as an individual age. So if you have someone doing jail time for 10 years for a violent crime, um, you know, we keep people in jail for violent crimes for 20, 50 years. Um, but the likelihood of them after 10 years committing that crime is terribly less uh, likely to happen. Now, you know, of course, Jason, you, you touched a nerve with me as a former narcotic. You know, I was you obviously were not in the narcotics division, right? I made sure I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> I I, it's sure. only just my opinion that, um, you know, I'm not talking about petty offenses or hand to hands of small amounts. Um, but for a large, I just think of um, how drugs completely destroy a community, um, you know, really have the ability from every aspect of a community, even just physically, um, you know, the household, um, what drug trafficking is doing. So maybe that's just at the federal level, you know, and not what's happening within a community in terms of large um, distribution and sales, but, um, you know. Well, what I would say to that, my exception to that statement is drug dealers that use violence and guns to control mm. and, you know, have beef with other crews. Like to me, that's your exception because if you're going to use violence to do this nonviolent activity, although I agree it has significant impacts in communities when it's concentrated that way, right? But I understand drug addictions a disease and all of that, but I am still one of those people who believe, well, if you use cocaine, right, you're part of the issue, even though it's a disease and maybe you're addicted, you can't help it. Like I can't get away from the fact that 
I haven't seen yet the drug dealer that forced someone to sniff cocaine. I'm just saying. Now, that doesn't make it right. That doesn't mean the drug dealer is a good guy. That doesn't mean the user is a bad guy. But there is some joint responsibility there, right? The question is, should you be caged for it when we know that the government can benefit, right? We have different states allowing for marijuana sale. Now, I know marijuana is a different animal than, let's say, Oxycontin, cocaine, heroin, fentanyl, all these different things. So I'm not saying it's the same thing and it's complicated, right? So I hear you. So for all the social media folks who want to rip it to shreds, you got it. But <laughs> um, people should not be locked up unless it's absolutely necessary, period. Well, I mean, listen, statistically, there are one million drug arrests every year in the United States, a million drug arrests. Um, and but uh, one out of five individuals are in jail for drugs. But we know that those individuals that are in jail for drugs are disproportionately in black and brown communities where the over-policing of the communities take place. Um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. And overall, African-Americans are 40% of those who are incarcerated, even though we make up 13% of the population. So whether it comes to drug offense, any kind of alleged low level offenses um, that we've been talking about during our time together, black people are always subject to racial profiling. We are always subject to greater rates of surveillance. We are always over-policed and thus overly detained and overly incarcerated as a result. It's a huge problem. We've got to figure out how we can deal with the ways in which racism infects every aspect of our criminal justice system, every single aspect. Okay, so now for the wrap up, um, you guys keep it tight. Leroy, um, Ben, Jason, I'll end with you, Kristen, going backwards from the order we started. Um, any last thoughts? But also let us know, you read anything really interesting lately or watched anything on Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, anything like that, that you in particularly want to recommend for people? Uh, what I have watched on um, Netflix was the uh, 13th Amendment. I thought that that was um, very informative about, um, you know, how, you know, in this country, uh, how that affects us. And I mean, I can't explain it the way they explain it in the uh, documentary, but I think that's a very good documentary to see if you haven't seen that. I yeah. thought that was a well, well put together. Ava DuVernay is, a, is an artist. She's a master. Mm -hmm. And Jason? I actually saw that documentary basically that exception to uh, slavery, they talk about the loophole there. Uh, really, I think about uh, it's a way of uh, allowing legalized discrimination, really. Because once you're termed a criminal, then that's why you can't get the job. And it's legal right. to say you can't work here just because you have this uh, thing on your record. Um, so yeah, but that is a, a great documentary, documentary to look at. Uh, I recently uh, came across, kind of by accident, uh, this documentary called Fear City. It's about how the uh, Giuliani, ironically, uh, took down the mob using the racketeering uh, laws and how it was first used to bring down the commission in New York City that was basically involved in everything uh, in the United States uh, commerce and how the mob basically dominated and was taken down. Uh, it was interesting for me because having had recently done a racketeering trial, I was like, I wish I'd seen the documentary before I'd done the trial because it would help me kind of think about uh, how the government goes about proving those and how they learned how to prove those cases. And it's a nice series because it's only three episodes. I like the short uh, <laughs> series because I can't watch like eight seasons or something. I just no. <laughs> so you, you're not a Game of Thrones man. I, I was, uh, you know, but I was watching as going along, but I can't do the binge thing, you know. So in Game of Thrones, who's your favorite character? <sighs> favorite character in Game of Thrones? Oh, I mean, you know, Khaleesi, man, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And the dragons, actually. <laughs> really? Oh, I never thought of them as characters, but that's, that's an interesting take. Yeah. yeah, I'm definitely a Jon Snow person. Yeah, you know, I like, he had a good heart, you know what I'm saying? So I, I appreciated his good heart and principled ways in yeah. a very unprincipled world. Yeah. What about you, Kristen? You know, I was trying to remember the name of the woman who got beheaded in Game of Thrones. Oh. Um, it was like one of the last episodes. Oh, the um, woman of color, one of the few women of color, right? Yeah. Right. Yes. She had her held high. She was one of my favorites. Um, she had her held her head high at the very end. Uh, anyway, <laughs> speaking of pr racial profiling, right? Um, so one of your one of your participants asked, uh, "What would be the one reform measure that we would?" move forward with right now. And I just, as we're wrapping up, just want to lift up the right to vote being really critical uh, to helping to achieve reform on all the issues that we've just been discussing. Because at the end of the day, who's sitting at the table and making decisions on these issues comes down to, comes down to who you vote for at the ballot box yeah. on election day. District attorneys who make decisions about who gets prosecuted and who doesn't. Sheriffs who run the local jails mayors who make decisions about who gets to serve as a police chief, it right, all comes down to the right to vote. Um, something interesting that I've watched, I, I've gotten into the shy lately. Um, I really, I really love the writing. And this season they're dealing with all kinds of issues, um, LGBTQ issues, uh, you know, a sexual assault, um, you know, being young and starting a business. It's just, um, I think, really great writing, and great acting. And um, yeah, that's been on my list. Any, any Anyone read any books lately or just mostly? And I'm reading a great biography on Frederick Douglass right now by okay. David Blight. Okay. I got that book as a gift for Christmas. So that's, that's around thick. here. I've, it's thick. <laughs> I'm, I'm in the middle of another one. I was reading uh, Alexander Hamilton because I went to see the play and I wanted to read the book. Uh, but I've been in that book for a long time now. So I don't know if I can really say I'm still reading it or not, but I'm getting through it. You're playing with it. I'm playing with it. <laughs> yeah, I read that Frederick Douglass book. That was good. What were you yeah. going to say, Lou? The book I'm reading right now, I don't know if it pertains to everybody here. It definitely pertains to Stacey a little bit. It's uh, called Love Languages. So I've been reading that book to quote unquote, be a better husband to my wife. Yes. As you know, just learning the love languages, stuff that's just her, her needs and stuff over mine. What's your love language? I've read that book. What's your love my, language? My love, my love language is, is hugs. I love hugs. Oh, so you're just yeah. okay. and my, 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 wife's love language, my wife's love language is um, um, words of affirmation. Uh. Yes, yes. You know, the dinner you made today was great. It was beautiful. That kind of stuff. She appreciates that. Instead of me taking that for granted. Love languages. Love languages. Love languages. Yeah. yeah. I figured mine who, uh, just, who's the author, but. Mine is just keep your shit together. <laughs> so, um, I, you know, I don't know if I've been watching anything as um, deep as you guys. I've really been... Um, like going back to the 1970s, I guess, in my own head. And I've been watching uh, Kung Fu movies. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I just finished in the last few days, I did the whole Ip Man series. Um, you know, Ip Man was uh, Bruce Lee's master, his sensei, uh, who perfected this particular form of Kung Fu called Wing Chun. Uh, so I've really been watching that a lot. I've been thinking about um, trying, you know, in my next life when I have time, carving out the ability to get involved in martial arts um, and take back up my piano. I used to play the piano when I was younger. So those are like the two things that I say when I have a life again, that's, this is what I'm going to do. No. That's interesting. That's a, great, that's a great choice. That's one of my, I don't have many regrets, but I regret not continue playing the trumpet. So I hear you on the piano. Really? Right? Yeah. Right? Uh, uh, Stacy, as you say that, uh, I, I'm not on so much of a sad note. Uh, one of my cousins on my wife's side of the family, he's uh, only one year younger than me. What was He recently passed away at uh, uh, congestive heart failure. 
Yeah. But you and him would have had great conversations about martial arts. He loved martial arts. Bruce Lee was his favorite. And yeah. he, he kind of, his 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 uh, personality, what he would say his personality is, is of three people, who is mm -hmm. Bruce Lee, uh, Michael, J Michael uh, Jackson, and Prince. So his thing was that he fights like Bruce Lee, makes love to beautiful women like Prince, <laughs> and and dance like Michael Jackson, and he and trust me, he did all those things. <laughs> he was so funny. He was so funny. Prince was known as a lover. Oh, I I didn't know that one. No, but he said beautiful women. He felt that. Oh, okay, okay, women. that's true. True. Yeah, yeah, Chewy, yeah. all of them. Yep, yeah, yep. It was, it was that's for, for the younger people watching. Chris, and I don't know if you know about any of that, but uh, <laughs> um, we're aging ourselves. I was well, born in the '90s, so I don't know anything about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, thank you guys so much for your time. Um, when you get a moment and you want to look back on Facebook at the comments, you guys can jump in there and respond to people if you get the chance. But um, thank you all so much for a Saturday morning. This is a pretty heavy conversation to have um, on a Saturday but I wanna thank you all for um, for the opportunity to share your expertise and your thoughts with everyone. Um, that's really important thank and I'm, I'm grateful to you all. Thanks so much. If you guys wanna take us away. So um, thank you all everyone for listening. Um, as you know, we're ramping up with the presidential um, races and I'm sure and I'm hopeful that this discussion about mass incarceration about racial justice, about systemic um, racism in this country is going to be front and center in these, um, you know, in shaping policy and what individuals, um, both the Democrat as well as the Republican candidates, will put in their platforms. I know for Virgin Islanders, uh, I had the pleasure this past week of being a member of the delegation to the Democratic National Convention for the Virgin Islands, and I sat on the platform committee. And as a member of the platform committee, really working on what is going to be the ver that uh, the democratic stance um, in um, in keeping uh, in in what what the Democratic Party believes should be um, its position for the Virgin Islands, and um, we were able to get um, the Democratic Caucus, uh, the Democratic uh, Party, to agree that. Um, there must be a solution to full voting rights for individuals from the small territories, that there has to be a solution that they cannot remain in limbo as a territory. All places around this country um, that were once territories, um, the federal government worked to solutions to include them as part of, um, as part of the United States. And so that needs to happen with the um, Virgin Islands uh, Guam, American Samoa, and Northern Marianas. What What do you mean, congratulations to Team Coconut? Team Coconut? No, no, no. Not Team Coconut, that's too dry. Team Guava, Team Guava, Team Guava. <laughs> well, everybody have a blessed week. Take care, be good to yourself, be good to everyone. Um, and everyone, please, please stay safe. Thanks so much, take care.